Only a few left of these to go. Rail of the Stars. This one's pretty obscure. I don't even think you can get it these days. Last time I saw it was on VHS. It's another war film. Not dissimilar to Barefoot Gun, but this time tackling it from a very different angle. An angle that probably should be approached more. The Japanese that lived in Korea at the time. Now, Korea was effectively under the imperialist rule of Japan, used mainly for exporting things like silk and other stuff, but they were kind of slaves. They did not have freedom of their own country, and the Japanese ruled them, and it wasn't exactly the nicest relationship, as this film goes into. It's quite a bold one for an anime war film. It does speak truth to power, in ways similar to Barefoot Gen, but approaches some of the areas that Barefoot Gen adaption skipped out on. There's a class system at hold here. You see Koreans being things like the maids for the Japanese, and that if the Koreans were to speak their native tongue, they are beaten by the Japanese boys. You are given a new name, you're given a new tongue by these invaders, and you just have to accept that. The war slowly brings struggle to the country, first in little ways. You can't get a colourful backpack, the materials are lesser, there's less money to go around, things are getting a bit more harsh. Certain sectors of the military are becoming more aggressive towards the Koreans who are rebelling. Although like most war films that Japan made in the anime variety, this is the focus of a young girl. The anime is based off an autobiographical description of these events by a lady called Chitose Kobayashi. The movie was released on the 30th anniversary in which it happened. This is also Toshio Hirata's last movie well, that he's credited for. And he did a good job at Madhouse. He was definitely one of the team members that pulled his weight and made some great films, especially in the war genre. So he's right at home to make this film. We also have Yoshinori Kane Mori, who worked on Yawara, which is about a fashionable girl. I would actually wanted to cover that film in Madhouse Month. There is a film that's based out of the show, but honestly, I just don't have the time. And I'm hoping someone else might cover it in the future. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there must be a, a very talented channel that could totally do that. Subscribe to Marion B. Now, the designs, they do fine, though this is not the most impressive looking animation you're going to see. It was probably made on a small budget with a humble beginning to it. The point is it gets the story across very well. It, it doesn't pull any punches. Now, I've seen enough of these war films to know that they can get very blunt. But with Rail, you seem to notice that it sprinkles out its dismay a little bit more even. A lot of the other films we're talking about, like Grave or Barefoot Again, they have these giant moments that encapsulate all the emotional weight of the situation, where Rail continuously happens to be just a smattering of awful events that these characters have to slowly work their way through. Beginning with the reality of living in 1940s Korea, typhoid. Your children can just die. And yeah, that is harsh. It is a really strong, blunt sucker punch for the beginning of the film. Usually they wait into the end to do that sort of stuff. But then it keeps going, involving another squeamish, visceral scene where... Just thinking about it kind of makes me uncomfortable. It's such a simple thing that could have happened to someone, but the aftermath of it was so cataclysmically harsher than you'd expect, and then the side effects that leaves on these characters is potent. Doji Harata is not messing you about. And we start to notice things like, yeah, the maid that they have, the Korean maid they have, she needs this job, and she is disposed of because of an accident, which I understand the sentiment of why, but it does not lead her to, it doesn't lead her to a, another career path. You get the feeling that Korean people are their second class citizens. They do not live with the same luxuries that the Japanese do, and that her replacement job may be much less glamorous and perhaps far harsher on her, considering the time period we're talking about and what would happen to Korean women. So yeah, um, just expect this not to be the most pleasant time, but of course it's not going to be, it's a war film. Halfway through, the war is lost, and then the rest of the film comes more about the conflict of being a Japanese person in Korea, which is now a free country, but it's beginning to become another war state. The Korean War is about to happen. You have people from Russia coming in, we have Koreans trying to take their independence, and a new battle is about to begin. One side, the South, is controlled by the American. The other side is in a bit of a disarray. These people, they live in the north of Korea. They're stuck in a land now where the situation is reversed. They have become the second class citizens that they treated the Koreans to be. Upon the end of the war, while the Japanese cry, the Koreans cheer. This is the outcome they wanted. 
but it does in a subtle way show how much the Koreans, how much the Koreans begrudge the Japanese for what they did to them. Even earlier on the film, you notice young kids talk about how much anger, unfettered anger they have for what they've done to their country. And these are not the kind of things that you tend to see in a Japanese film, although I may understand how they got away with it, because this is a very Japanese narrative. It's about overcoming the horrors of war that Japanese people faced. They may throw in a couple opinions of the Koreans as they go through their life, but that doesn't become the main source of the film's content, which to me is a little bit unfortunate. I feel that's some of the most interesting historical and compelling parts of the narrative. Although considering the tone of the story and that the story is about following a young girl, you're probably not going to get that much. The Russians are coming in with the Koreans and the Japanese are losing their houses. The houses that were built on stolen land are being given back, you know, you reap what you sow. But it still leads them into a very uncomfortable situation where they are living in these shanty houses full of tons of Japanese families just trying to get by to the point where they realize that if they live in this country much longer, it's probably not going to end very well for them that realistically they need to get back to Japan. Japan, all of intensively, has abandoned them. And at the lengths they need to go to protect their own family members because they did fight in the war, the very knowledge of them fighting in the war will get them effectively imprisoned or killed. And that they have to burn everything they had, their whole identity, their whole life, completely shattered in front of them. Even they did not have to struggle like the Japanese people in their own countryside, there are different struggles that the Japanese living in Korea had to deal with which is an investing narrative. Ooh, that's a heavy one. Yeah, this film doesn't stop hitting. It's an emotional roller coaster. Although, really, it is all about the beat for beat story. Don't expect any in depth character dissections or investment. It's particularly from a child's point of view. So, yeah, you may not get what, like, perhaps the Barefoot Gen books are pretty good at, which is an investing, more round picture of the people fighting the war and the people that are in this war situation. But you do get a well made, well directed set of scenes that paint a story you don't hear, usually. The rest of the film, after the probably two-thirds mark, is all about planning their refugee escape of the country. It becomes more about that movement, trying to get the train, trying to cross the country, trying to avoid troops. Like I said, this is very much a refugee experience. It's desperation, this whole group of people just trying to find their way to safety. And the OST, that's pretty good. Like some harrowing spiritual charging moving forward there's a sort of level of dismay but always pushing forward you need to keep going and i suppose that's very much the spirit of how the japanese would look at the situation for better or worse some have argued that perhaps the koreans or russians are painted a bit simplistic in the film but i would definitely argue that from the perspective of the child this is someone that has came into the house without any context and taken away their life although they do get a very good point in there which is effectively that yeah of course you don't get to keep this house we're letting you stay for the next day but you don't get to keep land that you have stolen from people yourself you have ruined some of these people's lives even if your family themselves were quite benevolent towards the Koreans and never really showed, well, a huge amount of dismay, but there's still an undercurrent of systemic issue there. This is under 80 minutes, and I think the novel probably went into far more depth here about the experience of living in this time and what they can and can't put in a movie is another thing, which always becomes the issue of like, hey, if you really enjoy it and you can find it, which I'm guessing you probably can't because I doubt they ever adapted the original novel. Uh, but if you could find it, it would probably be a good read. Even so... It may be one of the few animes that accepts the weight of the debt the Japanese have to the Koreans, including the final hurrah, where one Korean individual effectively walks them through the perilous path of getting to the south of the border. A situation that he had no real need to do. In fact, he'd been hurt badly by the Japanese' war efforts. They had stole his family members, his children, to be working as slaves in Japan, or even worse, maybe fighting on the, on the, uh, the war lines. They could be dead, they could be lost forever, never to be reconnected. And yet, he takes a moment of empathy towards the children and the elderly here, and knows that if he doesn't help them, they are all going to die. And at that moment, he realizes, yeah, I'm not going to let these people in front of me die because I can do something about it. Even if I do feel that way about the Japanese, even if they have hurt me, 
Hate on hate breeds nothing but more sadness. They do it. They are able to overcome the issues they face. You even get to see that the girl, Cheeto, say she grows up to be on Broadway, to do quite successfully by the seams of it. And she gets to have a passing goodbye with um, someone from a long time ago. But yeah, if I had one criticism for the film, it's a little bit simplistic. I would have liked to see more of the relationship with Korean and the planning and the other sides of the phases. It's very beat for beat. But yeah, I get it. We're going from the child perspective, which very much is an easy way for the Japanese to avoid any more contentious or complicated issues with these sort of stories. But like I said, Rail is definitely more progressive than some other war films that have been made. And it's good. It's a good film with a happy ending, which, you know, I guess these war films don't necessarily always have them. I hope it gets its own release once again in the future, because this is a story I think more people could or should see. And that's probably about it. Right, we're getting close to Christmas now. We are getting close to Christmas. I'll be uh, doing only a couple more of these. And then uh, Madhouse Month says goodbye, and we uh, move on to the next project, which I'm sure you'll be looking forward to. Thank you to my patrons, including Joven, and I'll catch you all next time.